This is the Pennyworth Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're back talking about Pennyworth Season 2, Episode 8, The Hangman's Noose. I ask you to ratify my status as pro tem High Chancellor of the Kingdom. We've suffered a terrible loss. And I've only been in this job a short while. But hopefully I've shown that I'm fit for purpose. I've won the support of our allies in the army. I've rallied the rank and file. I've brought a devastating new weapon onto the battlefield. Our enemies will soon be forced to surrender. Very soon. I stand proudly on that record. And humbly ask for your votes. Thank you. Each council member will speak in ascending order of rank. I say yes. 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 I say yes. The motion is carried. God save England! God save England! Back, fellow governors, we're talking about Pennyworth season two, episode eight on TV Podcast Industries. This one's called The Hangman's Noose, and I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow governors and Gothamites. I am one of your other hosts, John. Yes, The Hangman's Noose. Mm -hmm. No one actually got hung though here. Weirdly, you know, this I might have just noticed it for the first time. There's loads of nooses in the opening credits of the episode. And I was wondering whether it was on all the other credits of all the other episodes. The first time I've seen it is when London flips over, you see all the nooses swinging. I wonder if it was just in my head the name of the episode that I noticed it for the first time here. I'm sure it's been there since the start of the, of yeah, the show. Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. But certainly, um, yes, they. a lot of people are on the chopping block here. And yeah, I sure. guess... The reference is to the ultimatum that is received by the English League here. Yep. Uh, that the hangman's noose is sort of, dare I say it, hanging over them. Mm-hmm. Um, it is the breath before the deep plunge, as Gandalf would say. Right. Um, yep. Or it is, you know, the feeling of the axe on the back of your neck before it is chopped off absolutely yeah and hangman's noose uh, being definitely a uh, form of execution that the uh, english league have used before on some of the ma- members of the raven union last season right so uh, at the end of the season when harwood got sent off to prison uh, some of the other compatriots weren't as uh, weren't as lucky <laughs> as uh, as he was at the time um we are going to go into full spoilers of this episode obviously uh, as we go in as normal as we go into the detail of Pennyworth we are a little bit late with this episode a little later than we usually are with the Pennyworth episodes because well actually we just started podcasting a bunch of other stuff we're also podcasting on uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier over on Disney Plus um which comes out each week on Fridays uh, and we're we've also added Invincible the first 3 episodes of Invincible the new uh, cartoon or the new animated series uh, from Robert Kirkman over on Amazon Prime we uh, were able to cover the first 3 episodes of that last week so we have so much stuff going on that unfortunately Pennyworth got a little bit delayed only because it's the episode that comes out later than the others I'm also blaming the hour going forward as well yes. uh, to summertime yes we did uh, daylight there. saving time and <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, yeah. it was a shock to the system, only to get an hour less in bed. I know, not, not fun, not fun at all. Uh, but thank you so much for following us lo- along with us for this season of Pettyworth. Uh, only a few more episodes left. We were kind of speculating last week as to whether this was the last episode, 208. And then, luckily, thanks to Epix, uh, the next episode has already appeared in our previews uh, for episode 9. So we know at least we got one more, probably two more, uh, as the season closes out uh, for season 2. Uh, quickly call out uh, that there was a, an interview with 
Cast and Bruno Heller uh, at WonderCon at home uh, at this weekend. You can see that over on YouTube. Uh, a really good interview with all the cast, actually. Really good, really good fun seeing everybody there talking about season two, talking about uh, how it's all been set up. But what's really interesting about it is Bruno Heller seems like he's very in depth in writing season three of Pennyworth. Yes, what a shocker that was. Mm, well, yes, but no confirmation that we have a season three from no. Epics just yet. He um, says he's doing a treatment of season three, didn't he? I think that's how he phrased it. Uh, kind of, yeah. I, I like the surprise on some of the some of the actors' faces <laughs> yeah. when he says, yeah, "Wait until you see what happens in season in season three. One of the big things he calls out is now we have the four major people that created Batman. We have Thomas and Martha, of course, who technically biologically create uh, Batman and Bruce uh, we have Alfie who uh, who brings him up in in uh, and teaches him fighting skills as we saw in Gotham and now we have Lucius Fox on the show who's the fourth person who gives him uh, some of the uh, gadgets and technology and also some of his some of his core heart and and uh, ideas of how he deals with the world around him so uh, so now that they have all four of these people on the show Bruno Heller seems very confident that if he gets to season three we'll see a lot more of those personality traits that lead to the creation of Bruce Wayne and Batman uh, coming out in that season. Absolutely. And of course, the marrying of the human form with technology is very evident right at the end of this it episode. But is, we yeah. will get into that with our spoiler-filled discussion. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we uh, kick off with some of the episode details, remember you can head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com to subscribe on any podcast catcher of your choice to mm-hmm. listen to our discussion of Pennyworth Season 2. Uh, we are on Spotify, yeah. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, and any other straight-laced or groovy podcast player. Absolutely. And of course, if you go over to TV Podcast Industries or subscribe to the main TV Podcast Industries feed, you will get access to our Invincible podcast, plus our Falcon the Winter Soldier podcast, and hundreds of other episodes of podcasting that we've done over the last six years. So thanks so much for joining us. Let's get into our discussion about the Hangman's Noose. This episode was written by Seth Sinclair, uh, who wrote season one, episode four and also wrote season two episode four uh, which you spoke about a couple of weeks ago um the episode was directed by Catherine morsehead once again as uh, she directed episode seven of this series so the last one that was just up so we spoke about her last week john do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for season two episode eight of pennyworth the hangman's noose sure the death of lord harwood seemingly sparks the potential for the negotiation of peace terms as the English League, in an act of reconciliation, allows the funeral of Harwood to take place in League-occupied North London. But as both parties sit around the negotiating table following the funeral ceremony, the Raven Union deliver an ultimatum to the English League, to surrender unconditionally or feel the full force of the weapon's storm cloud. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, Bette and Peggy Sykes seek revenge for Harwood's death and go after John Salt's mistress, Vicky de French. They hope to use Vicky as a hostage, but while an attack on the conniving Salt is still on the table, Katie again persuades Bet to spare Vicky's life, and so Vicky becomes another window display at Sykes' house of pain. <laughs> Meanwhile, after staying in England to work with Thomas Wayne, Martha, Lucius, and the English League, Alfie has unfinished business with Gully Troy over the affair with his wife, Melanie. Confronting him at his house, and despite being prepared, Alfie is overpowered and forced by Gully to play a deadly game of cat and mouse in Epping Forest. Injured and bleeding out, Alfred manages to use all his survival skills to stop Gully, and is rescued by his best friend Dave Boy and his mother. At Raven Union headquarters, as voting by the Raven Council begins to install Salt as the supreme leader... A very familiar face joins the unanimous vote in support of John Salt. A very, very familiar face. Very familiar (laughs) face, indeed. Uh, Not quite the familiar body that we remember, but Mm. nonetheless a familiar face. Yep. A very shocking ending, really. We will talk about it uh, in a moment as we go through our main points of the episode. Where do you want to start, John? We normally start with Alfie, the boys, and the job. Uh, Alfie does have a bit of a core centre for the episode, but it is different to the main overall storyline this episode. Do you want to start there? Yeah, it really is. It, okay. it is the the game of cat and mouse, mm-hmm. the hunting of Alfred yeah. in the wood um, by Gully. And I not not his team. It is left to Gully. You know, he wants the... Um, the trophy in that sense. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's the, uh, 
uh, unfinished business between Gully and Alfred over uh, Alfred's affair with with Melanie. Yeah, Gully going full Jason Voorhees here as he uh, stabs uh, Alfie, sends him off into the woods and gives him a five minute head start and then just walks slowly after him following the trail of blood that really felt, it really felt, as I say, like Jason Voorhees. It felt like he was uh, going like a serial killer from a horror movie uh, in here. But um, but yeah, we do find out that he wasn't being on the level really with Alfie, even if Alfie had gotten gully. Um, he left strict instructions with his man to kill Alfie when he went back. So no matter what, Alfie wasn't supposed to get out of this thing alive. No, exactly. I mean, Alfred goes the completely prepared with a gun, Mm -hmm. but effectively the remaining members of Gully's team, um, you know, point guns at him, sneak in behind. And yeah, I mean, you're in this lovely sea of destruction and chaos that Gully has done. I mean, you know, uh, there's a great line where Alfred says, I see you spurred the TV, and then he chucks an ashtray through (laughs) it. Straight through it. Straight through it. Um, So yeah, Gully has not really dealt with Melanie's um, betrayal and her... um, leaving him basically oh, yeah. uh, very well at all but he hasn't gone after Alfie so you do have this really nice thing mm. at the start where Dave Boy um is is at Alfred's house with his mother looking yeah. after his uh, Alfred's mum and you know, he's just really on tenterhooks he's looking out uh, between the neck curtains mm-hmm. he's got gun in hand he's keeping everyone on edge uh, to the point where he has to sort of calm himself down with a good bottle of whiskey, of which he he goes through most of it before Alfred comes back. Any excuse for Dave Boy, though, to be honest. (laughs) But it it really is the sense that they feel Gully is coming for them. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's that Gully knew that Alfred would come to him. He knew that that sense of honour that Alfred has, the sense of, you know, finishing... uh, the unfinished business effectively that he would make his way eventually to Gully's house. Yeah. Um, which is a good thing he didn't leave to go to America then because otherwise he would be waiting there quite a long <laughs> Gully time. Gully forever, yeah. <laughs> he really would. And then as you say, you know, in order to give him an advantage, he, he stabs Alfred in the stomach mm-hmm. and gives him five minutes uh, head start in order to then hunt and track him down yeah. and uh, kill him. And the thing is here is that Gully is quite clear he is going to kill Alfred. You know, Alfred is trying to kind of give a bit of the old talk and get himself out of it. He thinks... Oh, yeah. Can we not just that, talk about it? Yeah, <laughs> he, he does think there's yeah. that, you know, he can do the cheeky chappy routine to kind of, like, calm everything down and to um, sort of dispel or, or or just sort of dissipate the, the tension and the proceedings that, he, you know, he knows are coming. Yeah. He, he feels he can deal do that um with you know his his banter his chit chat yeah. uh, but it's just it's not working at all and so you have this um th- this hunt through epping forest yeah. effectively yeah alfie's not alone though He's not. Uh, he is accompanied by Baza, who has returned as his spirit guide uh, throughout this section. I, I really like seeing Haynes and better back on the show. Yeah, me too. Uh, in, the, in this role. We saw it back in episode five, uh, just a, a short moment, really. Uh, this time he seems much more like a guide to Alfie, but I love that kind of idea with him where Baz is kind of telling him, you know, why the hell did you... Uh, did you not go to America, basically? These are all thoughts that are within Alfie's head. Remember, this isn't, I don't think, a ghost visitation from Baza, uh, at least in these opening uh, kind of conversations between the two of them. Because uh, I love where Alfie's asking Baza, you know, do you have any practical information for me here? And he's like, <laughs> well, you're stuck. You're gone. You're, you're bleeding out, mate. You're going to be dead in a couple of hours. Like, that's Yeah, it. stop running because you're just, you're just uh, making the blood spurt more uh-huh. uh, with the exertion that you're doing. But yeah, I mean, th- this Baza, as this spirit guide was really nice. I mean, yeah. it is the thoughts of of Alfie, mm-hmm. but I also like to think that it is um, his thoughts 
as how Baza would say them. Exactly. He, you know, what he would expect Baza to say to him. It, it is that kind of good, bad angel uh, on the shoulder yeah. type thing. The guys, and, yeah. and Baza is the voice of reason yeah. and logic and rational thought. Yeah. Um, you know, Alfred here has gone off on impulse with what happened with Melanie in yeah. terms of suddenly deciding not to go to America. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it is really nice. And it, it also, again, just reminds us of that importance that Baza had mm-hmm. within that group, uh, which is really, is really good. Yeah. Uh, and, you, you know, he's there saying, you know, I'm also here to t- show you the way, um, once, uh, <laughs> You know, if you die, yeah, that ca- so well. That's the one I was wondering about whether that second kind of appearance of Baza, where we have uh, the light coming out, they're going to go into the light moment for for or, or asking Alfie if he wants to leave now and uh, not live, then Baza will guide him on the next stage. Effectively, I was wondering whether they were really making a comment on you know, as I say, the, the first bit was just the thoughts of Alfie translated to Baza, and the second bit was actually Alf- Baza returning um, from the world beyond, effectively to to guide. Guide Alfion uh, to the next life, I suppose, in some way. Like, is that the way they were kind of doing it? That that one's the thoughts inside Alfie's head, and the other one is actually the spirit of Vaza uh, coming back. No way to know for definite, but I like that there could it could be. Well, know? and I think the light at that time is coming then from the Gully's van, yeah. where one one of his uh, henchmen is, is waiting there for Gully to return. Yeah, um, and you know, again. Then he tries to um, set upon Alfie. Yep. Uh, but luckily, in the nick of time, we have um, Mrs. Pennyworth uh, along with um, Dave Boy uh, coming in here as mm-hmm. well. Now, in fairness, Alfie's got the moves. And I, I guess the, the great thing here is that, you know, uh, Alfie does managed to escape from Gully by using all his survival techniques, all the techniques he's used in the jungle uh, during the military. And most and, importantly, the one that he learned from Gully, yeah. uh, which is a great scene because he just don't catch it immediately what's happened. You wonder what he's doing, yeah, don't you? It's like as if, you know, you think that he, that Gully stepped on something and, and a piece of, a piece of branch has just happened to impale him. But then as it pans out, uh, you realize that's the trap that Alfie was setting for him. Yeah, know? the release mechanism, Alfred kicks away, mm-hmm. and it, it's this big pointy stick yeah. on, on a on a, a recoiled branch yeah. that gets Gully in the side. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, you wonder where the hell this branch is coming from because you don't necessarily fully connect what Alfred's doing with his feet yeah. when he kicks away this kind of supporting stake that's keeping the the trap um coiled exactly uh, for release so yeah. it's it's really kind of good Absolutely. i really liked how they played into the, the the you know his former military past there and also i guess the the cherry on the cake in a sense at least for alfred not for gully um <laughs> is is that it's one of gully's own techniques that um, he has yeah. taught Alfred and and his his unit yeah and the uh, the kind of gallows humor humor from Gully where yeah. he's saying that he actually killed the person that taught him uh, how to do it as well so <laughs> yeah. and that was quite an interesting one just want to quick uh, quickly shout out uh, the teaching moment I suppose for Alfie here is that he actually says to Gully um, I'm so glad you made me do this you show me how much I love this you show me how much I want to be in these kind of situations so interestingly uh, Gully was just doing it effectively to torture Alfie chase him down and kill him um, but it turns out that now he's gotten Alfie back to the kind of person that he was before he's really good at this and he really likes being in these kind of positions and fighting against other people you know um, considering he looks I, I think he's pretending to be hurt much more than he is when Gully arrives, and then he is able to uh, fight back against against Gully. But when he makes it back to the car and Gully's man attacks him, um, I think by that stage he is pretty close to death, um, as we saw from Baz- the Baza visitation. But he's still able to jump up and still able to beat uh, the guy in hand-to-hand combat. combat. So um, Alfie's a pretty tough competitor when he wants to be and when he, when he needs to be. So Yeah, most uh, definitely. I think as well the other good thing about just coming back to Baza as the spirit guide um, you know, he, he actually mentioned something really important to Alfred as well here about, you know, that he, he, he's, he's a good person and he's searching to, 
for that, but that, you know, he, he's always strayed from that path. And mm. what he needs to do is, is search for a call in order to put his talents and that to best use. And that really, for me, feels like a massive setup as to how Alfred would view, um, his employment with Thomas and Martha True. Wayne yep. and with Bruce Wayne, mm-hmm. um, you know, as Batman yep. uh, and even growing up uh, as an orphan, that is the sense of duty and purpose and mm-hmm. um, the, the call to do something good yep. uh, that, you know, really I felt connects in. I, th- I think you get that from him, from his desire to stay in England to try and do something meaningful yeah. as well. But I, I like that it has this personal touch from Baza because Absolutely. you can sense that coming from, from Baza if he was still alive. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Exactly. Um, it's like how many times you're going to try and undermine your own, um, life, you know, yeah. by doing things that are going to corrode it or, or sort of, impact it you know yeah, yeah exactly and and just and kind of speaking to that i suppose at the end when uh miss p arrives with dave boy he does call for an ambulance for gully he doesn't leave him out there to die he does he does make the right choice to not kill him effectively yeah so, exactly uh, that is that is choice speaking of mrs p uh mrs pennyworth her right hook in the house with the uh with the other um henchman i suppose of gully uh is so good i love that she just takes the uh the silk scarf off her neck wraps it around her knuckles gives a couple of punches to uh to uh the woman that's supposed to be guarding gully's house and uh, gets the information out of her as to where alfie's gone uh, i thought that was great just to see uh mrs pennyworth in action definitely <laughs> and she's the one that persuades dave boy and to to go yes. and for her to go with her so like she you know Again, it, it's it's that motherly element to her. Mama bear. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, which was really, uh, really good. Yep. Yeah, once again, not off the road he licked it, as, uh, as we <laughs> no, say about Alfie. <laughs> Let's get on to the English League and talk about what's going on with uh, with their connections. We normally put in Thomas and Martha into the English League, since Martha's a member, and Thomas has lots of connections in there. So this is where we'll probably talk about... Um, our big reveal to Thomas of uh, of the pregnancy of Martha, because um, it all seems to be going quite well. Uh, you know, they're fumbling yeah. at the door and they're they're going inside for a night of passion once again. It seems to all be back on track, doesn't yeah. it? Really? Yeah, they kind of mended the, their differences last week, I suppose. Um, we in in the scene we didn't see on screen, the scene where Martha convinced Thomas to stay in England and join up with the English League. So you can tell they've mended their relationship, you know. Um, But I love how this scene plays out. I love this whole idea where she's kind of wants to tell him but doesn't really have the words to tell him. And then he says, you know, I've got a condom in my wallet if if you need me to use it. And uh, Martha kind of responds, well, if we're going to have sex, you don't really need the condom because you didn't use one last time. (laughs) You know, I love, again, it's that kind of way that Martha has of being very adversarial with Thomas. Like it's almost like she's attacking him and he's attacking her all the time. This is a a, a really interesting relationship. We know from right the way back to the first, uh, first episode of the first season, these two characters, they really have a different type of banter and they challenge each other constantly. Um, Sometimes in a good way, sometimes pushing things forward and sometimes in a really negative way, like we see here where, Thomas takes his absolute standard approach here and goes, well, if you're pregnant, then I insist that we get married. I'm going down tomorrow to the courthouse to get get us marriage papers. And that is not the type of person that Martha is. You know, Martha was looking for, propose to me, maybe, you know, ask me to marry you. And then we'll go and do the go and do the thing. And if I say yes, kind of thing. But because he's going, I'm, I'm going to have to make an honest woman of you now that you're pregnant with my child. You know, I'm not going to have a bastard in my family. Like there was no romance in there at all. No consideration for what Martha might think. So he's well, I was going to say he was kicked out of the house. She leaves him behind when she goes out to get some air. And that's kind of it done from her point of view. Uh, what do you think of this kind of uh, moment between the two of them, John? I actually really liked it because I think moving forward, I can see that, you know, you can envision Thomas Wayne and Martha Wayne in the future mm. not being this perfect married couple. Exactly. And that she's a, 
strong and confident about herself Mm -hmm. and i like this i actually like the idea that maybe it's martha that is the driving force here uh in in bruce's life a bit more at least in terms of that know-how getting stuff done um you know being that kind of freedom fighter side of things Mm -hmm. and thomas is maybe on the more medical side the you know strategic side of working with and you know such as like the gcpd but Mm -hmm. because of his experience in the cia and and i i kind of beginning to really enjoy this notion that it's not that um perfect picture book kind of um couple and i like that she is very sure on what she will say to Thomas yeah. and she will not take his nonsense. Absolutely. And once again, another great uh, Bruno Heller touch, uh, the, the showrunner for the show, another great touch from him. You know these two are going to end off together. You know they're going to have at least Bruce Wayne as, as a son and they're going to live together and you know those stories of those characters. But once again, another moment when they could have uh, it could have all worked out fine. Uh, this could have been a moment where Thomas goes and he seems quite happy. He seems, you know, no particular issue with her being pregnant. But because of how he handles it, they're pushed further apart again. Even though everybody knows they end off together, they're pushed really far apart once again. Um, something we'd never mentioned on the podcast, I think, uh, about um, Thomas and Martha Wayne is that they, well, at least in some comic book stories, they do have another son. Um, they do have Thomas Wayne Jr. So we were wondering, Thomas Wayne Jr. tends to be the older son of Bruce in, yeah. in comic books. Um, so po- possibly this is Thomas Wayne uh, Jr. That's that's um, that Martha's pregnant with at the moment. Um, so maybe things aren't all happy uh, with their first child. Uh, if they're going to go down that path of having Thomas Wayne Jr. How do you think that would go down with fans of... Uh, of this universe because Thomas Wayne Jr. is not well not very well known it's usually someone that's quite hidden uh, and uh, and jumps back out as when story requires uh, it to be it to have a villain connected to Bruce Wayne so we've seen Thomas Wayne in connection with the Court of Owls for example um, we've seen Thomas Wayne uh, appear uh, I think once or twice more over the many many decades um, but what would you think if at the end of the series Martha gives birth to a child and they name it Thomas Wayne Jr. How do you think people would react to that as not Bruce if that was the choice? Yeah, I, I guess it's all leading to, to Bruce, but I, I guess I could also see it being Thomas just because of the age of Alfred here. Mm-hmm. You know, I pretty much um, Alfred is quite old when Bruce is, on, is born. Certainly when, um, you know, he takes those first steps towards being Batman. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And you're thinking that's maybe 20 years. So I still think it's really early days mm-hmm. of Alfred Pennyworth. He's still that kind of, you know, young guy. Yeah. Um, and so it's really conceivable that it could be Thomas Wayne Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, I Whether the fans would like it, I'm not entirely I'd sure. I'd like to see the reaction. I think... <laughs> I think definitely, you know, everyone just, as you say, because Thomas Wayne Jr. isn't as well known, yeah. it is about Bruce. And I think it would be um, tough not to do that. But there is that potential pathway in the story yeah. for it to be Bruce's older brother. Well, like if you want to line it up with everything you know, they don't always line these things up. And, and as I say, in a lot of media, there's no mention at all of, of Thomas Wayne. So um, so they could just ignore it or they could say, well, to be absolutely factually correct, we have to have an older brother before Bruce comes along. So let's let that be Thomas Wayne Jr. You know, they could they could do it that way. I'd just be intrigued to see uh, what the reaction would be from the audience. And if something happened, like, for example, if Martha put Thomas up for adoption, maybe if she didn't feel like they were going to have this relationship you know i don't know there, there's choices that that could make it uh interesting for for being thomas wayne jr yeah absolutely so, but absolutely. there you go uh, just really intrigued i really really liked the scene because we knew this was coming we knew at some point thomas would find out uh, that martha was pregnant with his child so uh intriguing how he dealt with it how badly he dealt with it and how it's uh put another wedge in their relationship which eventually will uh will be healed in some way 
Absolutely. Uh, I think the other thing here as well with the broader English league is we do have Alfie kind of being an intermediary team yes. coming back into the circle of the chain, you know, the upper chain of command mm-hmm. in the English league with Aziz and the Queen. And we see him there going with Aziz to meet and, and parlay with the Raven Union yeah. um, um, immediately after Harwood's death. Uh, and the the meeting afterwards, but then Alfred has this unfinished business and kind of leaves, and um, and and really it then comes to the the English League, I guess, and the Raven Union mm-hmm. are intertwined with the possibility of a peace treaty between mm. the two sides, and I think yes. here we can move uh, to the Raven Union, um, because of the death of Lord Harwood. The, there is this move by John Salt and Field Marshal Thursday, mm-hmm. uh, and I think he they met on a on a Friday <laughs> um, for the funeral of Lord Harwood to be held yes. in uh, North London, mm-hmm. in English League occupied North London. Um, like and, we're talking comic books here. Yeah, right? this is a comic book TV show, right? And and you know nothing is evidence more than the end of the episode that this is definitely based in the DC Comics world, right? And um, so when they do things like having uh, Salt saying, "Well, we want to have the funeral of Harwood before we sit down and have any kind of arrangements about uh, about any kind of uh, peace treaty, we're going to have that funeral," and then. You have the conversation with where where he's talking to the the assistant um, who uh, who works in the Raven Union, and she says, "But nobody's going to be able to come to the funeral if you have it in London." And he goes, "Oh yeah, I know, but that's not the point." Instantly, I was going, "Well, that's it. the the casket of Lord Harwood is going to contain uh, not his body, but." Um, Stormcloud. Stormcloud. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to be released at some point just after they all get out of London. It's going to be released from his casket. Like that's instantly what I'm thinking of yeah. is all the plans of Joker and all the plans of the villains of Batman. You, you were thinking the yeah, same as I was well? thinking exactly the same yeah. thing here that it was a, a Trojan horse basically. Exactly. Um, into, uh, English League occupied London. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting. That's, that's not to say that within that casket, there, there isn't uh, something ready to go True. off yeah. and effectively weaponize it into the atmosphere. Yep. Uh, but for sure, I thought something was going to happen there. I, I thought they were a bit silly, like the English League, not to at least have some kind of check. Yeah, and some kind of presence there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but I guess if he's being <laughs> buried there as well, they could always dig him up and then check. But Maybe. I mean, yeah. Although, I, I, although very smart of them. They didn't want to be at ground zero for it they wanted to watch it on television in case anything happened right so all, yes. all the members of as, as you see around the city um this broadcast that's coming from the funeral with sir john making his speech to camera is being broadcast to everyone's home everybody's watching it every every member of uh, of our major cast uh even some of the minor cast that we haven't seen in a couple of weeks sanders there and her father sid uh onslow are, are stand, sitting there watching the tv yeah. watching this this speech so um so a really good kind of moment where you show the power of what's going on with the Raven Union, with Sir John being able to reach so many homes with his speech about the um, impact that Lord Harwood has had, about the light that's come from him, about keeping his um, his ideals going, and we should all stand behind those ideals to support his vision. Of what England of what should English be. Should yeah, be. Exactly. exactly. So, so he has used this moment. To yeah, it's propaganda for 100%. the Raven Union, yeah. sort of, you know, on the coattails of the popularity that Harwood did have. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, because they're, they're saying his death was a heart attack. It, yes. You know, it, it, so, and it's interesting because in the funeral as well, you've got, Bet and Peggy sat on the back row, yes, kind of glaring at John Salt, and I thought they were going to do something because it's not overly guarded. You know, it's mm. not like mass ranks of Raven Union officers and Raven Union army personnel yeah. at this funeral. Like, there's not very many people in the congregation at all yep. so it, it, it's really um I, I thought they were going to do something i love um, bet and peggy here that they, yeah that, that's exactly what you see at a lot of funerals you just see the two 
ladies at, sitting at the back watching everybody and just commenting on everybody in the room. <laughs> so I love that what Bet and Peggy are actually doing because it's them. They're picking out the victim, or at least Bet is. They're picking out who is the person we can get to Salt through. So yeah. Uh, so they're sitting there wondering who the blonde waving at John Salt uh, mysteriously, uh, not really hiding who she is at all. Uh, they're wondering who she is, and it turns out it is uh, it is his uh, his his mistress. mistress yeah, Vicky Dufresne. Yes. Yeah, the actress. The from, actress, uh, and so I mean, this again. This is a nice little moment. I mean, Bet and Peggy, the the rapport between the two of them, mm-hmm. um, it is just so good as they go, um, to and kidnap, um, Sir John's mistress from from the theatre. And Vicky starring in uh, the West End in a play called um, Cuddle Me Corporal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're British and of a certain age, uh, you'll definitely remember the Carry On movies. I think a lot of people would know the Carry On movies. This is what this felt like. This is the Cuddle Me Corporal. Yeah, this is the theatre equivalent of the Carry On movies. Yeah, so yeah. massively dubious, um, I guess, in, in terms of the, the story, uh, I would uh, say. <laughs> absolutely. And I was getting some vibes of Barbara Windsor from, uh, from this actress. Definitely. She's in Vicky. a very very short sort of um hot pants with then the 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 um army uniform on top i think yeah i think it was just a jacket and her underwear i'm not even sure if it was even short pants she was wearing <laughs> underneath <laughs> but i love how they just drag her out of uh, of the theater and again the um, the in, the intimidation that comes from Beth when uh, peggy's asking a question vicky doesn't answer and peggy says she asked you where you on television? Yeah, so it's just you know? really good. As, um, as Peggy I say, going, do you have a boyfriend? Peggy and Bet repeating. She asked you a question. It's a simple yes or no. Do you have a boyfriend? It's so intimidating from from Bet. I really love uh, the two of them together. Yeah, they're really good. They're yeah. really good. But and we do get a bit more insight into their relationship, really, when uh, when they take uh, Vicky back to the shop and uh, Bet is challenged by Katie. Uh, she's been told and, and has. Um, promised Katie that she won't kill anybody or won't won't hurt anybody and we do get a bit from Peggy here where she sits down and just kind of goes I go along with what you say Beth you make these decisions and I clear up after you but I don't stop you yeah yeah yeah, absolutely it, it, it seems like a different relationship than I was seeing in the past but now it makes a lot more sense I suppose um Peggy's not an active participant in everything that that Beth's doing, but she knows it's much harder to st- stand in her way, like Katie's doing, really. Yeah. And um, she knows it's more difficult, and she doesn't stand in her way. She just says, "Whatever you want to do, you go ahead and do it, and I've got your back." Effectively. <laughs> so, yeah. um Even though it's probably the wrong decision most of the time. But there's a real nice moment as well because Katie challenges um, Bet again and says, "I'm not going to allow you to hurt." Um, Vicky de French, and mm-hmm. um, because of what John Salt has done, yeah, and it's really nice because Peggy is making a cup of tea at the time, and as Bet is considering what Katie ha- has just said uh-huh. and which way she's going to decide, you've got the 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 whistle of the kettle just going. You're thinking, is this the end of Katie uh, and and Bet? And it's not. Bet re- relinquishes again, but mm-hmm. she does make it quite clear that. In respect of John Salt, he is not off the table. Absolutely. Um, that revenge will happen yeah. with John Salt. It's, I don't care um, what I've agreed to. John Salt is definitely getting it, basically. Yeah. <laughs> you're, totally, he, you're totally right, though. I, I mentioned it before that if you've got a period piece, you use the phone to uh, to punctuate the intensity or you use the kettle uh, yeah. boiling those are the two things that really you can use from uh, from the 60s and 70s particularly in the in England uh, that will really show the intensity of the scene always yeah it, it's really good and of course hilarious because Vicky de French becomes another front window display uh, at the Sykes house of uh, pain and the other guy gosh. is still there they're both trussed up in in leather mm-hmm. uh, with the gags and um, everything <laughs> it's, it's almost like something out of hannibal lecter to uh-huh. an extent it's 
so so good it's so funny um, I, I love so just funny. The, the pan across uh, across <laughs> yeah, the, the front window <laughs> you're gonna get this expectation if bet's allowed to be out of prison for much longer there'll be you know 20 or 30 people <laughs> stuck inside that yeah window. it'll be the missing persons <laughs> list and it will yeah. be about 25 people crammed into the front <laughs> window uh display of sykes house of pain and um, yeah it's just i mean i wonder if kate uh casey is going to make it there i thought at one point oh, as really? the whistle was going off i was thinking oh Uh-oh. you know because of the friendship with harwood you know mm. you, you do get that sense from peggy and bet that you know this is a matter of honor yeah. and so you know katie puts herself in the way of that i guess promise to harwood that they made yeah and so you know i really thought either it was going to be over or potentially she was going to make it into um, the the front window as well. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> that would be a, an end to a, to the love story, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Wow. Well, I suppose the other thing we need to talk about with the Raven Union and in and English League is the peace treaty. Effectively, um, I really like this moment with Salt and the the crew from the Raven Union who arrive at uh, the English League headquarters, or I guess Buckingham Palace by the look of the yeah. place. I, I guess that's where they are. I'm almost definite. <laughs> I haven't been to Buckingham Palace, but I can tell that's the type of building they're in. Um, but it's interesting because the English League think they're there for a proper discussion where there's terms and where there's uh, where they negotiate effectively and. The flip of Sir John, effectively, now that they've gotten what they want, which is being able to bury Harwood, being able to get their face out on TV, being able to talk to people they wouldn't have gotten to talk, get their propaganda out there, effectively saying, this is unconditional surrender that we want, and Aziz, Prime Minister of the country, and the Queen both have to give themselves up without any question at all um, to the Raven Union. So yeah. um, quite a significant flip on what they'd said, but I love that he does call out. That's exactly what I said was going to happen. I said I was going to come here and we were going to have this discussion. I never said that that we were going to arrange terms or have a or have yeah. a, a peace treaty or anything like that. I said um, we would come to this arrangement. Yeah, it's not a negotiation. Yeah. It is an ultimatum. Yeah. Um, and it's w- with the backing of um, a pretty – well-known biological weapon in storm clouds yeah. and and so this really does put aziz and the queen in a very very tight spot and yeah. i guess that that explains why you see aziz and the queen then getting close i mean it holding hands on the sofa and um, and a little bit of a, a nibble um, so, <laughs> well, and so every kiss yeah exactly yeah so i i reckon you know i they've, guess they've, it's, they've much... got they, there's a lot for them to lose and so that's kind of suddenly made them a little affectionate towards well i think another. this moment really is them saying that's it we're done there's no no other way out of this situation we have to give ourselves up is yeah. what that feels like it doesn't feel like they're getting close because they happen to be sitting on the couch together and had no, one no, too many exactly. glasses it's of sherry. It's the tight situation. It's, uh-oh, oh, we are done before we go down. Um, let's have a kiss, <laughs> effectively, before we go. Um, and we also see at the end of the episode here, the big kind of big final moment that we said we talk about, the end of the episode here, we have Sir John taking over uh, the Raven Union. He has made his way up the ranks now officially. Thursday had said that wasn't going to happen. The army were going to be the ones that would be in charge of the whole situation. But we know that he has been making these moves to get himself into this position. Sir John has been making his moves all the way from you know, getting his title of Sir John um, and now getting a unanimous vote from every everybody in the room including somebody that we absolutely didn't expect to be back. Absolutely uh, missed you. not. Well, I say that, but I think we did actually start season two going, one of the comic book tropes of never seeing the body um, means that it's possible that someone will come back, you know? Well, that the is true. The explosion happened. We uh, we know that Alfie shot and didn't kill his father uh, in that explosion, and we saw Alfie and the Queen getting out of the building, effectively, but that didn't necessarily mean that um, Mr. Pennyworth was fully dead or didn't make it out. We didn't necessarily mean that. And now we know Mr. Pennyworth has been turned into Davros from Doctor Who, effectively. Um, looking <laughs> very like 60s Davros there. Uh, and it links back quite nicely the initial meeting between Aziz, Alfie, and Salt, and mm-hmm. uh, Field Marshal Thursday. Yeah. Um, because 
Salt makes reference to his dad, and he did in episode one as well. That's and true. again, it, it seems like another pet project of Salt mm -hmm. um, that he's been working on yeah. because. Uh, you know, Salt has mentioned that his dad was a true patriot, and so this idea of that kind of living embodiment. But I, I wondered, it was it was really interesting, that move where Salt was getting ready to go to the Raven Council chamber. So that seems to be like that vote was the political side of things. Yeah. You didn't see anyone in the army, though. You just That's saw true. the people in their black uniforms. Yeah. Um, and it kind of cuts to sort of buttons being pressed and like ventilator type thing. And I was thinking, is this something to do with Stormcloud? That this mm -hmm. is the, you know, this was the bomb part and the pump part for sort of weaponizing in the air, the Stormcloud. Uh -huh. yeah. And so when it pulled back, that all those components that you were showing were to keep Mr. Pennyworth alive um, in his new kind of Davros form, yes. then it was like, Oh wow! Okay, they've actually done this, yeah. and like fair Jews, I this is really interesting because yeah. you know we've seen Alfie have those um, you know memories and flashbacks where he's been talking to his dad all through the season. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, his his mum still talks about him as well. So <laughs> this you know will be an interesting revelation for the Pennyworths. Absolutely. Once again, we are in a comic book universe. This is DC Comics in London. Um, that's absolutely what they've always said. This isn't uh, a hysterical show. Periods are mixed, all that kind of stuff. And when you do get a comic book moment like this that feels like something out of Gotham, which is another show from Bruno Heller, it really does feel like something like that when you have a character returning from the dead and being kept alive by the villain and also supporting the villain being the father of your main character is always a, a great a great comic book touch. I was really impressed with with it, seeing it. And really what I was thinking when I when we saw Sir John getting ready and all those kind of moving pieces, the the um the scientific stuff going on in the background. I thought he was torturing somebody else. I thought this was like what he did to George Orwell earlier on in the season in his introduction effectively. I thought he was it was just going ah, to okay, cut yeah. to the fact that he's still a uh, he's still a murderer, uh, you know, but it turns out uh, the opposite actually. He's, he's trying to keep somebody alive um, for nefarious purposes, of course. Yeah, for his own gain, I yeah. guess, because of the standing of um, Mr. Pennyworth in the Raven Union. Exactly, exactly. And he, he's a martyr, effectively. Yeah, you know, he was. Or yes. he was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no longer right. What, what do you do when you have a, a suicide bomber who actually didn't comes back from the dead? What, what's that called? I a don't hero, know. I guess, if you're on that side. That's true, that's true. Um, I think we've covered off the full episode there. Is there anything else uh, you want to talk about, John? No, I've got no notes from my side. Uh, only one I wanted to pull out was just, as we usually do, some translation of... Um, of uh, Things that are happening in the Cockney rhyming, rhyming slang of London. Uh, we've talked about uh, we've talked about the word Larry quite a few times. It's mentioned here again. Uh, things are getting a bit Larry, you know. Um, but the other one that came out here is Alfie right at the start of the episode saying, uh, "If everything get if if things go a bit lemony, um, I'll be watching out," kind of thing. So lemony is kind of a, a weird one. This sounds a little bit like um, a a Jack Bannon line um, <laughs> or it sounds a little bit like there's no direct translation for it, let's say. But the one that I would say it's closest to is um, you've heard this phrase before, don't be such a lemon, like this kind of, yeah. idea, don't be so smart. It's, yeah. it's kind of a, re a really negative term that you'd use. Uh, the, the way that they say it in uh, in kind of Cockney, Cockney slang is more, you know, the guy was being a bit of a lemon, so I punched him, is kind of the, the way you'd say it. So basically what Alfie's saying is, if things get a bit a bit violent, a bit brutal, effectively, is what you say in here. So um, so if, thing, if things starts to go sideways, I'll be here, is what yeah, you're saying. Yeah, okay. It's understandable in the context. Yeah, it's course. one I, I, one I mean, yeah. I've, I've heard of your, your lemon, yeah. uh, which is kind of like you're a fool or, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, in this context, I thought it was, it was, but it was fun. It's yeah, kind of exactly. you know, crazy language <laughs> for for Cockney Londoners. I like it. That's our, at least that's my interpretation. Once again, not being from London, uh, John. How would you rate this episode of Pennyworth, uh, season two, episode eight, The Hangman's Noose? Um, I would give this four Terminator dads out of five. <laughs> yes, like um, with added laser beams. I really like this. I like the fact that you know. Um, you, you had this strive for peace between the English League and at least in good faith with the Raven Union. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
I love that this was undercut by just the conniving, the ambition of John Salt. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, he has been, um, behind the scenes furiously sort of feathering his own nest in order Absolutely. to achieve power and influence uh-huh. and, and ultimately um lead the raven union and um, truly becoming the comic book villain yeah now, definitely you know, like we said harwood was starting to show signs of being uh so much more comic book villainy as the seasons went as the second season went on you know just getting the metal nose in the first season wasn't enough this season he got more and more like a comic book villain and now john salt stepping up from the background uh really standing out as that comic book character yeah, yeah and i i like how not then, that he is a comic book character well, no sorry. but i i like then how you know on the personal front there's that strife for peace from alfie towards gully you know he wants to make amends and to kind of wipe the slate clean and you know put that marker down and let move on effectively Mm -hmm. and and that doesn't work either you know gully doesn't want to hear any of it yeah um but it's ultimately i think moving to um alfred actually getting a sense of the purpose within the english league and for his home country and also for him personally what he that he what he must do and i think that came really nicely from baza and um, and i really liked him baza back w- in, in that context Absolutely. i thought it was really good yeah. and of course what's not to like about um you know part machine part human <laughs> father returning um, that's going to cause all sorts of eruptions um, in the Pennyworth household so Absolutely. yeah that was a pretty big bombshell yeah. um, to to finish on but they, they keep not something I expected us. either yeah they keep getting us though John we've done five seasons of Gotham two seasons of Pennyworth and still they do things like this and we go we would never have predicted that was going to happen <laughs> and it's not like it's massively unusual for the story to do things like this but it's just they, they, they don't signpost it um, enough for us to guess these things. Maybe we're just not good at guessing. <laughs> maybe. Maybe that is the case for sure. But yeah, really good episode. Two more to go after this one. Uh, really really looking forward to seeing how they wrap up this season and really hopeful that they do get a third season now after hearing uh, the idea of uh, of what's going on from uh, from Bruno. Yeah, Heller. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Interesting. I have a little bit of feedback uh, to go into as uh, as we close out the episode. Uh, first up, Angie Arhus says, it's great TV when the Psych Sisters put the beat down on someone. Is it me or is Peg's hair getting bigger with each episode? I agree with you guys. They do seem to be rushing the story since their hiatus ended um does this mean they're trying to wrap things up and there won't be another season that'd be a bit of a shame i was hoping for a bet psych spin-off that would be awesome actually <laughs> and psych sisters, a, yeah. a psych sisters spin-off mm. um i think it'd be really good and i mean interestingly enough i think bruno heller has you know dangled that little um enticing snippet that there could be a, a season three here mm-hmm. i mean nothing's been confirmed so it sounds all really quite positive and mm-hmm. um, that you know he's getting into the nitty-gritty of a season three yeah. of pennyworth so if he's if he's yeah. writing the scripts and the show isn't produced by epics we're sending bet round to his house to pick those scripts up and find <laughs> out what, how, how the show would have continued <laughs> and i'm totally with you angie yeah the having the psych sisters on screen is great. Yeah. Uh, really, really enjoy seeing uh, th- these two on, on screen. In I, I, absolutely. And I know this feedback was on a, an earlier episode in the season, but they're great in this episode too with another beat dead. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, Roger Sprong says, starting with the first episode this season, I was getting a Casablanca vibe. This pretty much clinched it. When Bess and Peg are getting away at the end, walking through the trees with their shoes off, <laughs> it looked like the same setting they walked through last season. Oh, it could be. Yeah, it yeah. could be indeed, yeah. It could be. It actually probably is, uh, to be to be honest. We probably have that, that scene even with Jack Bannon uh, in this episode. Um, and, and with Gully, sorry, with, with Alfie and Gully, uh, that possibly is taking place in exactly the same forest where they film all this stuff, you know, because... Um, it's very costly if you go into multiple different forests, but yeah. if you film it from different areas, uh, it's probably uh, probably much easier. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean about about the Casablanca vibe, but I, again, I love the twist of the Casablanca. You know, this the, could be the start of a beautiful friendship. Um, probably not <laughs> from <laughs> from Alfie. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, uh, thanks, Roger. Valerie over on Twitter after watching this episode says, "For heaven's sake, what have they done? Alfie's dad, part man, machine. I can't even imagine where the show goes from here. Hopefully, not too far fetched." I don't think I like it, but we'll see. 
Well, exactly, Valerie. I yeah. think it, it was a complete shock. It, mm-hmm. you, you didn't really get the sense that this was going to happen. I guess it's almost a bit like if they decide that Martha's baby will be Thomas Wayne Jr. Yeah. rather than Bruce. Uh, you know, what will, what will happen? I, I guess the great thing about having Alfie's dad as this part man, part machine is just how it will impact Alfie uh-huh. and potentially his mother. Um, yeah. Who knows where uh, his dad will get to. Maybe that chair that he's in can lift off the ground as well, a bit like Davos. Uh, so, maybe. you know, he could fly in to visit um, his, his <laughs> wife, effectively. Um, well, what so, happens if Alfie has to take his father out a second time? What would the neighbours say if he killed your father twice, John? Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alfie definitely be running off to America at that stage. Yeah, thanks so much, Valerie. Um, and M- Mrs. Anna Angel Bannon says, I just finished it and I'm completely shocked at the ending. Mm-hmm. I didn't see that coming at all. Another brilliant episode and the very sexy Jack looked hotter than ever as Alfie. <laughs> Even with the gaping stab wound and yeah. the blood oozing shirt. <laughs> maybe uh, he certainly looked great uh, in the opening scene uh, in his brand new suit I uh, love that little comment from him to his mom where he's going no, look at me ruined another suit again after being <laughs> yeah. stabbed uh, very good very good stuff uh, thanks very much Anna that's uh, that's, some, that's some really fun thoughts I know it's it's just a shocking uh, shocking episodes uh, I love I love uh, getting the reactions in from people on, over on Twitter as well it's really good to hear uh, your thoughts thanks so much once again for joining us for the Pennyworth podcast on TV podcast industries Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on TV Podcast Industries. You can search for it on any of the podcast catchers or podcast players of your choice. Uh, you'll get access to all of our coverage, including Invincible, Falcon the Winter Soldier, and Pennyworth, which we're currently covering every week at the moment until uh, until all three of those shows finish. Yeah, and we've just finished our coverage of WandaVision as well. So there's kind of another slight period piece, at mm-hmm. least for the first few episodes. and um, Over... Uh, on our podcast feed as well. Uh-huh. And all of those shows are supported by your help, your support. Uh, you can support us by sharing the podcast uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, wherever you are. Sharing the podcast is sharing the love. You can also support us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. Every euro, every dollar spent uh, goes towards the podcast and goes towards production of all of these episodes that we put out for you every week. Yeah, thanks so much, fellow governors and fellow Gothamites. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will return with Pennyworth Season 2, Episode 9, Paradise Lost, uh, next week. Uh, and we'll hope you will return to join us for our spoiler-filled discussion of all things uh, to do with Paradise Lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, thanks so much for joining us, as always. It is a pleasure chit-chatting with you, Mm. fellow Gothamites and governors. Uh, Bye. Speak to you again next time. Bye. Bye.